Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> so the theme of the theme of today's session uh, is distortion. And uh, as I was thinking about this, uh, it occurred to me that the very concept of distortion implies that there's an original or a real version of something and a distorted version. And uh, that sort of line of thinking about there being an original or a real version versus a distorted version really begs or poses or brings up one of the very oldest questions in psychology and philosophy, which is, of course, do we see the world as it really is? So do our powers of perception and reason really give us a sound and accurate picture of the world? Or is it the case that our perceptions and our reasoning uh, are always incomplete and flawed so that perhaps we are only ever able to gain an incomplete or perhaps a, a, a picture, a, a, picture of a, a shadow of reality, uh, which is really what Plato thought uh, approximately two and a half thousand years ago. Um, of course, uh, the everyday answer, the everyday answer to this question is that perception certainly seems to work perfectly accurately and perfectly well. Uh, despite all the glare, uh, I can see a world of people, I can op open my eyes and see a world of people and objects and be very, very confident that I can take a few steps forward and walk around the obstacles in front of me, pick up the objects and talk to the people talk to the people that are, that are here. So, um, so perception seems to work perfectly well. We seem to open our eyes. It seems simple and effortless. Uh, but is it really that simple? It, is, it re is it really that straightforward? Well, uh, an approach which is available to us here in the 21st century, which of course wasn't available to Plato uh, and his contemporaries, is to look inside the skull and ask, well, how much brain power is involved in the uh, apparently simple act of just opening our eyes and looking out at the world? Well, if we, look at, if we do look at, uh, inside the skull, what we can see is the, uh, is the, the surface of the cerebral cortex, the surface of the brain, the cerebral cortex, uh, is divided into four main lobes, uh, as we can see here, the occipital, parietal, frontal, and temporal lobes. And it turns out that all four of those lobes of the cerebral cortex are critically important for vision. Uh, not only that, of course, underneath the cortex there's a whole range of subcortical brain structures, and it turns out that several of those are also critically important for vision. So. Uh, I've always been very surprised by this. It's always been surprising to me that so much of the brain, the, uh, uh, which we think of as our organ of thinking, uh, is really devoted to this apparently simple task of just seeing, of, of perceiving the world. Uh, of course, on the other hand, it's also true that when we think about thinking and when we talk about thinking, we often do that in highly visual terms. We talk about ideas that are opaque or hazy or perhaps crystal clear. We talk about theories that may be insightful or enlightening. Uh, and we talk about people who are very bright uh, or perhaps if we want to insult them, we might say that they're a bit dim. So, uh, so perhaps you can see what I mean here, you can, and you can see uh, where I'm going. So, uh, so vision is something that in our everyday lives we take completely for granted, uh, and we use phrases such as seeing is believing. On the other hand, uh, perhaps like the character Neo in the classic movie The Matrix, uh, we can occasionally become aware, of, become aware of little cracks and fissures in the structure and sort of coherence of our visual reality. Um, so if we look at this picture here, which is a still from The Matrix, we can see that Neo uh, is holding up four fingers. And I hope that all seems completely obvious to you. He's, he's holding up four fingers there. And if we move to this slide and I ask you again, how many fingers am I showing you here? Again, the answer seems completely obvious. Well, obviously there's three, but if we look at a more complete picture, uh, we can see, well, but well, actually, perhaps the answer might be two. Um, well, you might say, well, well, that's just a visual trick. Let's look at something a bit more straightforward. Let's, let's just get this straight. Uh, and if I ask you, are these lines perfectly, uh, uh, are these lines straight and parallel? Again, the answer seems very obvious. Obviously, they're, they're straight and parallel. Um, 
But what about these ones? If we look at these ones, do you think these ones are straight and parallel? Well, as I look at them, there's no way that they look straight and parallel. They seem to be sort of waving all over the place. But if we superimpose the two slides, we can see that, in fact, both sets of lines are perfectly straight and perfectly parallel. Uh, so this is a very well-known illusion. It's called the cafe wall illusion, and it's called that because this man here, a uh, very eminent uh, British psychologist called Richard Gregory, was having his lunch one day, several, uh, many decades ago in Bristol, and he glanced across and saw this, uh, this particular cafe wall, actually, uh, noticed the illusion, described it, uh, and then studied it. Uh, and a uh, little, bit, little bit closer to home, actually, here's a, here's a much more scaled up version of the cafe wall illusion, uh, which I believe you can see on the side of this building uh, in Melbourne. Okay, so, uh, so perhaps seeing isn't always believing. And one of the things that has a strong influence in, on how we see things uh, is the context in which we see them. So if we look at these two orange discs here on this slide, uh, this is another very well-known illusion called the Ebbinghaus illusion. Uh, we can see that the one on the right, um, the one on the right looks relatively big, the one on the left looks relatively small, but of course we'll be looking at the one on the right in the context of these uh, somewhat small uh, little grey little discs, whereas the one on the left is we're looking at that in the context uh, of these much larger discs. Uh, and if we take that context away, what we can see is that, in fact, the two disks are exactly the same size. Um, so it turns out that context, uh, that context can have some very powerful influences on the way we see things. Um, we often talk about people who see things in black and white. And the reason we say that is that black and white do seem like such polar opposites. I mean, you couldn't possibly argue you know, that black is white or that white is black. But uh, let's just have a look at this illustration here, which is a very clever demonstration developed by a vision scientist called Edward H. Adelson. So what we can see here uh, is uh, a black and white uh, checkerboard. Uh, and if I ask you, which of these two squares is darker, square A or square B? So which one looks darker? Well, I hope you'll agree uh, that A clearly looks uh, quite a bit darker. But if we look at this illustration a little more, more carefully, what we can see is that we're looking at B inside the shadow that's being cast by this large uh, uh, green cylinder. So let's just see if A is really darker than B by taking away the visual context uh, of the rest of the figure, including the shadow. So let's lose the, lose the left-hand side the right-hand side, some of the context around the two uh, squares, and we take away the last little bit, and we can see that, in fact, A and B are exactly the same brightness. So we can argue, actually, that black is white and white is black, uh, and, it's not an, and it's not an entirely silly thing to, uh, to say. And just to show you that there's no, there's no real jiggery-poker here, Keep looking at A and B, and let's put the context back in. And as we add in the shadows and the rest of the figure, you can see that uh, when we add the, context, add the context back in again, again, uh, A looks totally different to B. OK. So what we can see from this uh, is that context can have these very powerful effects on the way we see things visually. So what about how we see uh, the world of ideas and beliefs? Does, can context also have powerful effects in that more abstract cognitive domain? And I'll illustrate, uh, I'll illustrate this by talking about a very well-known study uh, carried out by these two psychologists here, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Uh, and as many of you will know, uh, Kahneman uh, went on several years, uh, several years after this study was, many years after this study was published to, uh, to win the Nobel Prize. So back in the early 1970s, Kahneman and Tversky dreamt up this scenario, which as you can see is uh, spookily relevant to the situation in which we find ourselves today. What they uh, asked their research participants to do was to imagine that the country they were in, uh, New Zealand in this case, uh, is preparing for the outbreak of an especially virulent virus. And people were told, if urgent steps are not taken, we're going to lose 600 lives. So then the participants were asked, uh, were presented with this choice. They were asked to choose whether or not we should adopt 
program A or program B. So, a pro so the programs could be to do with uh, alternative vaccines or it could be to do with lockdown protocols and so on. Uh, some procedure for reducing the impact of the virus. And what the people were told was, well, if we go with program A, 200 people are going to be saved. Whereas, if we go with program B, there's a one in three probability that 600 people will be saved and a two in three probability that no people will be saved. So when faced with that choice, a large majority, 72% chose program A. They preferred the certainty uh, of saving those 200 lives. However, what Kahneman and Tversky also did was to recruit a second group of participants and and these second, this second group was given this choice. They were told, if we adopt program A, 400 people are going to lose their lives, whereas if we adopt program B, we have a one in three probability that no one will die, and a two in three probability that 600 people will die. When faced with these choices, a similarly large majority, in fact, a slightly larger majority, went for program B. But if you look at these alternatives carefully, or even not that carefully, you can see that, in fact, the information is exactly the same. Uh, losing 400, 400 of the 600 lives is exactly the same as saving 200 of the 600 lives. And the information in pro for Program B is also, in fact, identical. So what we can see from this uh, is that is that if we present uh, essentially identical, fra identical information in different frameworks, in different contexts, we can produce radical changes in people's preferences and judgments. So if we present, uh, um, yeah, we, we, we can produce these very strong changes uh, ju just by changing whether or not we present the information in terms of saving lives or in terms of losing lives. Um, so we've got an election coming up here in a few weeks' time, and I gather there's another election uh, happening in America at the beginning of November. Uh, and of course, if any of the candidates and parties in those elections won a majority in the mid or high 70 percent, uh, they'd be absolutely delighted and ecstatic. So, uh, so what we can see from this uh, is, is that these context effects can produce very powerful and very dramatic effects very dramatic influences uh, on people's preferences. So context can be critical. Uh, in perception, even when you're judging something that seems simple and straightforward, such as how bright something is, how large something is, whether or not we have a straight line, but also when we're making these complex high-level judgments about what we should do uh, when faced with a global pandemic. So. Uh, so what, what can we learn from this? What can we conclude from this? Uh, you might be a little bit worried at this point and think, well, can we ever really trust our own perceptions and our own judgments? Is our view of the world really at the mercy of the particular and specific context that we just happen to find ourselves in. Uh, you might uh, worry and feel like W.B. Yeats that, you're, uh, that your head is spinning uh, at this point because the things you thought you could see clearly uh, and the foundations of your beliefs and judgments, perhaps suddenly they don't seem so firm anymore and perhaps they're suddenly more fragile and, and perhaps prone to disintegrating. Well. I think that would be that would be a very negative con uh, a very negative uh, uh, conclusion. But I and I think there's a much more positive way of thinking about the way in which context can influence our perceptions and our judgments. And I'd like to illustrate that uh, by stepping away from psychology for a few moments and stepping into the realm of physics. Uh, and of course, the the second part of our question is really centrally about the nature of the world. And of course, questions about the nature of the world are really, really in the province of physics, not the province of psychology. So um, back in 2016, uh, this man here, Carlo Rovelli, uh, wrote a fascinating book called Reality is Not What It Seems. And one of the points that Rovelli made in this book 
is that we can view reality from multiple perspectives. So we have our everyday perspective where we have a world of solid objects, a, a world where objects uh, appear solid there and they exist at a particular place in, uh, at a particular location in space and at a particular point in time. But Rovelli points out that that breaks down completely when we start to think about what's happening at the almost unimaginably tiny, uh, uh, tiny spatial scale and brief time scale of the way in which fundamental particles interact with each other. And of course, our perceptions of time and space are also radically different. When we consider the, mo the, much, uh, the almost unimaginably large time scales where stars and whole galaxies may form. So, so, reality, so we can see reality from multiple perspectives. So, so I think the, 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 the message that I'd like to finish with is to say that when we approach a really big question, such as, do we see the world as it really is? We're very unlikely to get a complete answer by looking at it from a single perspective. If we, want, if we really want to gain a more complete, uh, a, a, a better and more complete answer, we're, going to, we're almost certainly going to need to step out of our own uh, particular contextual silo, as it were. And that silo might be your, your own academic or scientific discipline. Um, uh, of, course we, uh, of course, at the moment, we're living in, uh, in very difficult and challenging and potentially very divisive times. So perhaps there's also a more, perhaps there's also a broader lesson to, to learn here uh, about trying to think about issues from a different perspective. And of course, that different perspective might be the perspective of somebody who's at the opposite end of the political spectrum to the, to the location where you are, or it might be somebody from a different social or cultural group. Um, Psychologists refer to this as perspective taking. The ability to see something as it might be seen from a different point of view. Um, and recently, the neuroscience of perspective taking has, has uh, made some quite interesting advances by looking at the brain regions that become active when you imagine looking at a visual object from a different point of view, or if you imagine adopting a different belief from the belief that you currently hold. And interestingly, uh, some very common areas are lighted up when you do both of those things, when you imagine a different visual point of view and you imagine a different cognitive point of view. Um, so that's perspective taking. It, it emerges quite early in childhood, uh, in stages between the ages of about two and five years old. Um, and the final thought I'd like to leave you with is that uh, we know that young children can do perspective taking, but perhaps it also might be something that's be going to be very beneficial and helpful for us uh, to practice that a little bit more uh, as adults, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as when we were children. Uh, and, that's, uh, and thank you very much for listening. Thank <laughs> you.